I can't believe I have to say this. This is absurd. But to remove a massive amount of form from the penis and expect not to affect its function is insane. It is naive and it exhibits fundamental misunderstandings of both biology 101 and the history of circumcision. 99% of which was an outspoken attempt to control and repress male sexuality. Only in the US, only in the US is it done for medical reasons. And only in the US are there multiple multi-billion dollar industries that rely on the continuation of circumcision to continue to rake in their profits off of the backs of our children's sexual futures. Which will bring me to censored fact number four, also known as the medical malfeasance behind the circumcision industry. But to wrap up censored fact number three, removing this body part is damaging. It is obviously damaging. Circumcision was designed to damage you, and that is exactly what it does. Circumcision significantly damages you for life. The foreskin is important. Yes, these three facts are true. There is no ambiguity whatsoever. Now, heavy shit. But you may be asking yourself, if these three facts are true, which they are, how does a supposedly scientific authority, like the American Academy of Pediatrics, recommend circumcision? Well, I can't just tell you. It's too radical. But I can show you. I can show you how they did it. And that is exactly what I'm going to do. Now, remember when I said all these mainstream sources recommend circumcision? Well, what they're actually doing is they're deferring to the American Academy of Pediatrics. Now, what the American Academy of Pediatrics did is they wrote a circumcision recommendation in 2012. It was a one-page policy statement supported by a 22-page epidemiological technical report, which, by chance, I happen to have here with me. <laughs> now, this may seem daunting to most of the public, the American public, which is largely scientifically illiterate. Well, I am not just scientifically literate, I am scientifically dominant and modest. I started working under senior faculty here at Harvard when I was 18 years old on a graduate level textbook on the thermodynamics of energy consumption and climate change. I wrote my college thesis on quantum tunneling. I'm not kidding. Here it is. <laughs> this report, this report right here is child's play to me. And I will tell you exactly what it has to say. Now the summary is, the health benefits of circumcision outweigh the risks. And what are those benefits? They include prevention of urinary tract infections, penile cancer, and transmission of some sexually transmitted infections, including HIV. Now, I'm a pretty hardcore nerd, and I like to write things in equations. And it's very easy to write this recommendation in equation. So we can say the benefits outweigh the risks. Now, notice implicit in their frame, there can be no negatives to circumcision because we know the foreskin isn't important, right? Now, we, let's quickly dissect this. We can write the benefits as UTIs, penile cancer, and STIs and HIV. So urinary tract infections. Just to be clear, women are 10 to 50 times more likely to get a UTI. And we never suggest amputating parts of their bodies. And if we were to take the AAP's numbers at face value, which we shouldn't, it takes 100 circumcisions to prevent one UTI. At 20 compelling sexual functions per foreskin, you need to remove 2,000 sexual functions from men to prevent one nothing infection that's easily treated by antibiotic. That's insane. They're just grasping at straws. It is inconsequential is what it is. Penile cancer. Sounds scary, right? Well, it's one of the rarest types of cancer on the planet. And according to the AAP, it takes anywhere between 922 and 322,000 circumcisions to prevent one case of penile cancer. Do you know what that discrepancy means? Between 1,000 and 322,000? It means they have no idea. They have no idea how many circumcisions it takes to prevent one case of penile cancer. This is because it is so absurdly rare, the data doesn't exist. Besides, besides, it only exclusively affects elderly men, which makes this completely irrelevant, completely irrelevant to neonatal circumcision. 
The case that it prevents is STIs. Okay. Well, just to be clear, almost all of the literature is a confusion between causation and correlation because genital cutting cultures do not simply map onto non-genital cutting cultures. But even if they did, even if they did, the U.S. has both the highest rate of sexually active circumcised males and the highest rate of STDs and HIV in the developed world. Now, the nuance here is, this doesn't necessarily mean that circumcision doesn't prevent the spread of STDs, but it certainly suggests it promotes the spread of STDs, and there are sound immunological reasons for this, namely by drastically altering the mechanics of intercourse, which causes pain and bleeding, which opens pores for pathogens to exchange between partners. But it does unequivocally prove that circumcision is not a primary STD deterrent. To claim otherwise is a claim of lunacy. It really is. Now, the claim that it prevents HIV. Well, HIV is scary, so let's take a closer look. <clears throat> now, through all history, circumcision advocates have claimed that circumcision prevents the scariest disease of the era, whether it be masturbation, syphilis and gonorrhea, cancer, now HIV. Surprise! <laughs> now, who here who here has heard the popular claim in the media that circumcision prevents your chance of contracting HIV by 60%? Wow, okay, most of you it seems. Well, we're going to take a closer look at the numbers is what we're going to do, because I'm a scientist. So if we take a look at the three randomized controlled trials that the media often cites, what they actually found, if you aggregate the results, is 2.5% of intact men got HIV and 1.2% of circumcised men. That is a 1.3% difference, much smaller than 60%, wouldn't you say? So how did they get to 60%? Well, what it was, it was a relative risk reduction, in that 1.2% is about 60% less than 2.5%. Now, if you take a look at the studies, which I did, which I'm eminently qualified to assess, you see this list of blaring methodological errors which are cumulative. Any one of them could easily account for the 1.3% difference. If we take a look at just one, they taught the circumcised group how to use condoms. <laughs> Seems like a pretty relevant difference to me. <laughs> now, to use two very small, very poorly measured numbers and report their relative risk reduction as a factual rate of reduction is not just disingenuous, it is dishonest. The claim that circumcision prevents HIV is no truer than the claim that it prevents masturbation. It is a lie. And this is an erroneous claim. Now, if we sum up the left sides of the equation, we have inconsequential, irrelevant, and erroneous benefits outweigh the risks of the procedure. And what are the risks of the procedure? Well, according to the AAP, they tell us not once, but twice that the true incidence of complications after newborn circumcision is unknown. They have no idea. And then, just to hammer the point, they say, and I quote, it is difficult, if not impossible, to assess the impact of complications because the data doesn't exist. The data doesn't exist. Did you know? Did you know? There is no legal requirement for circumcisers to report complications in this country. Which brings us to the new equation after doing the math. We have these vaguely defined, highly dubious benefits outweigh the unknown risks of a prophylactic amputation of a body part. And do you know how many times in this scientific document they mention the functions of the body part? Zero! Zero! Not once do they mention the function of the foreskin. Implicit in their frame, it is completely useless. I just spent an hour describing how important the foreskin is. The foreskin is massively important, and everybody knew that is why they removed it. Whew. I'm going to get all worked up again soon, but you can tell me. Calm down, Cropper. But do you know how they have the audacity to make such an omission? Do you? Well, they say, and I quote, the literature review does not support the belief that male circumcision adversely affects sexual function or sensitivity or sexual satisfaction, regardless of how those factors are defined. Regardless? Do you understand how broad of a statement that is? 
Who knew? Who fucking knew that amputating a large part of your sex organ affected sexual function? Oh, that's right. Literally everybody throughout all of history. That's why they did it. That's why they did it. Did they forget censored facts one and two? That both rabbis and physicians circumcise children to damage their sexuality in the most fundamental of ways for life? Now, it's very telling if we take a look at their literature review. <laughs> they reviewed 1,028 articles. That is a big number just to make it look like they did a lot of work. Do you know how many focus on sexual satisfaction? Just one! Just one! Remember this study? And they ignored its conclusion that the foreskin is the most erogenous part of the penis? And do you know what they had to say about all the overwhelming irrefutable evidence that demonstrates just how important the foreskin is? They say, and I quote, they failed to provide evidence that the circumcised penis has decreased sensitivity compared with the uncircumcised penis. And do you know what they based that statement on? Nothing! <laughs> Nothing! They just say all the overwhelming evidence to the contrary? We're not going to include it. Now, <laughs> you might be thinking to yourself, wow, Clopper, everything you say is logically sound and consistent, and I think I agree. That's good. That means you're thinking now. You're doing something they don't want you to do. Now, just so you don't, don't think I'm some fringe activist up here, what I am telling you is the prevailing worldview. If we take a look at what the rest of the world has to say, I mean, only in the US and Israel do they think it is a good idea to cut into the flesh of newborn children. See, the Royal Dutch Medical Association says, circumcision is a violation of the child's right and can and does cause complications. Or the German Pediatric Association, there is no medical reason to circumcise a boy before he can give consent. And virtually all other pediatric societies worldwide hold the AAP's views as nonsense. Or Australia and New Zealand claiming the AAP technical report on circumcision is epidemiologically incompetent and an embarrassment to the AAP. Yeah! Boo AAP!